Hello, good evening. Excuse us for the technical difficulties. Now we are going to have a talk about HPC in Debian, the distribution for uh, clustering, and Fabrizio Canini is with us. So, Fabrizio. Hello, everybody. Um, since I came here in last Saturday, I was thinking of what I'm going to tell you. Um, I'm not I'm not sure about it right now yet, but um, what I what I know is that uh, I've seen some problems when I'm res first when I began researching to change my the Rox Linux installation of my company's cluster. Uh, I noticed that there was some uh, that there was pretty much documentation available. But uh, um, what I noticed that most of the times that uh, things that just don't work, yeah, like you had a lot of things uh, manually do. You had to do, you had to edit configuration files, you had to make templates or whatever sorts. But uh, there's a lot of uh, manual work to do. Uh, things that I uh, you didn't need to do, like when using rocks, for example. Um, and also, uh, it seems that people doesn't seem to be aware. People, what I what I mean, people is that um, most common of people that use clusters, like um, scientists and engineers. Uh, especially for numerical simulation problems in um, weather forecast or uh, physics or chemistry or um, geosciences also. So whatever, whatever you need a huge amount of computing power um, most of the people they, they don't they don't seem to to be aware that Debian is also a great distro for making this kind of um, for this kind of task. So um, what I'm actually what I'm actually proposing right now um, we have the tools. Um, have the tools. We have a lot of um, tools by this by this um, in this area. Um, MPI implementations, uh, libraries, um, task managers, and you go on. And compilers. We have GFortran. We have GCC. We have G++. Uh, that now on G now on version 4.3 they have uh, OpenMP implementations, which make for which makes which makes them uh, on the same level that um, commercial compilers like Pathscale, like Intel, like PGI. Uh, I figured that we should um, reach out to these people, see, hey. Uh, what do you think about using Debian this in a cluster situation, or especially people that is uh, already using Be already using Debian on the situations? Hey, what do you think about uh, what do you think about using Debian in a cluster situation? Uh, was it hard to set up? Uh, where d where did you find uh, any difficulties? Um, what could go What could be automatized? What is the the boring tasks that could be automatized? Um, also, yes, of course, reaching out people that don't use that don't use the, that have not have to choose to not use Debian for uh, this kind of environment. Why uh, why have you cho choose another s another solution of? Why have you choose to go with Susie or Red Hat or Rocks or CentOS or whatever? See where you can where you can improve. 
I think that um, you know most of the cases that uh, Debian is successfully used in a, in a cluster environment, it usually takes uh, what I call um, an inside champ for doing such a things. Something that uh, somebody that is already on the organization and that uh, already knows Debian that is, is, has been using it for quite some time, and uh, this guy knows knows how to do it and he wants to he wants to to do it, but he wants to, he needs most of the times he needs to convince uh, his his workmates or his managers. Sorry, uh, his managers that Debian is indeed the right the right thing to do, the, um, the right distro to use. I think that with with uh, we had to pick pick people from like uh, Debian Science mailing list, which has a lot of um, HPC users. I think we had to um, like like I said before, we have to we have to reach out. We have to know what these people need so that we can so that we can um, improve Debian, so that we can go on one step further to avoid domination. Um, I think it also would be, it initially it would be great to, have to, to make a main list to discuss what is exactly this, this, these people need. So, um, what I'm proposing to do I'm going to well. I'm going to to reach out these people and see what they want. Um, in a research like uh, like f what uh, Paul has done, Pebs, to but more specifically oriented to to this kind of situations. Uh, I'm also I'm also going to start working on Debian cluster components. If you don't know, it is. It's a very nice um, project. It is ah, we don't have wireless, right? Do we have? Do we have? Oh, right. We do it. Ah, uh, right here. No. Well, whatever. <laughs> well, uh, links will be backed on on the on the lecture, on the 
the session links and contents. Um, this guys, uh, I've been talking with uh, I've been talking with the developers of Debian cluster components, and they seem to they seem to really like Debian. Uh, they really want to know. They really want to to make this work. And they I think they share the same the same will that I am that to make Debian um, the distro for cluster environments. So now I, I like to see, I like to, to know, um, I like to know from you who, who from you are using Debian in, uh, in such environments, what you think about, what it could be, what is good, what is bad, and what is ugly, and what can we do to improve it, uh, which packages would you like to see in Debian? Which packages do you use? One of the nice things about uh, di distributions like Oscar and Rocks is that typically you can have a single CD that you put in the system, you boot it, and then you can boot your different client nodes off of the supercomputer. That type of a distribution would go a long way uh, to helping people utilize uh, Debian in, say, a high school or a situation to allow the students to practice using and programming supercomputers. Yeah, there there are some there are some there are some projects like this. There are some like Pelican, like Pelican HPC. Uh, that there's a it's a it's a bootable CD. Uh, there's also Parallel Gnopics that it, it does like it does something like this. Uh, Debian cluster components they also do. They also have a, a CD like this that you boot on a CD, and that you they are, have already um, you have a host and three virtu virtual. Uh, nodes so that you can so that you can uh, use it for uh, learning how to manage a cluster, how to use MPI, how to program with MPI, and how to not even this, but you can do like uh, learn routing or anything you like, and it has a lot of and it has a lot of. Uh, of the standard tools that you use it, like uh, LAM, uh, MPI, OMPI, NPI, compilers, Python, and Java. I think it's what um, this is nice for. This is nice for educational purposes. Um, surely, it also it's something that we should take a look. But what I'm what I'm what I'm trying to do right now is to 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 see to know what exactly what the point is at which point is we are right now, and we have a lot of users and we have a lot of tools. But uh, what more do we need to 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 make it to go up and to to make things better to to the users? Which is which are um, our final target, and do we do I answer? It? <laughs> Mike, Mike. Um, what's your personal background about uh, sub, uh, clusters? I work in a weather forecast company in Porto Alegre, Brazil. So uh, I've been there in uh, more than more than a year working working there. We have uh, six node clusters, uh, six node cluster, which those uh, the weather forecast for the whole Brazil, twice twice a day. It's, yeah. It does the weather forecast for the whole Brazil twice a day. It takes some three and a half hours 
for the simulation to 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 complete. Uh, it takes also um, some ten gigabytes per node of of generated data. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to. That's what I'm trying to. I've I've been researching. Uh, that's what I've been researching. The right now we're using a Rocks Linux uh, installation. That's what I'm trying to to put them out and to to put Debian in. And while researching this, that's what I've I've come to to realize that uh, uh, what people were doing to. What people were doing to to have Linux to have Debian running uh, in a cluster environment. So since since uh, last year I've been mentioning, well, what can I do to make it to make it better? What can I do to make it things uh, go smoother or go just works? So for people. Um, in a cluster environment. Another question that you would have from a marketing standpoint is what is the penetration of Debian in clusters as opposed to the other competitors? How many people are using the different versions of Linux in in that? And you know, if Debian is two percent, well then you might say that there's a lot to be done. If Debian is ninety percent, then you say, well, you know, the other is just noise. And so the question is, how many, you know, what percentage of sites use Debian? I guess uh, we could say that Debian is not um, really the, th the number one in the number one in uh, in the cluster usage. Um, at least if you s if this looking by the top 500 uh, clusters of well, top500.org, if you want to know. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, clusters that they just don't they just don't they just don't don't release uh, which version or which distro they are using uh, they just don't they just say Linux uh, but the most popular distros for cluster cluster environments they are SUSE nine and ten. Um, Red Hat and the price three and four. After that, they come CentOS and Rocks, and after that, Debian. There are some, cl there are s a few clusters running FreeBSD. Um, one or two running uh, HP UX, and a dozen running. <laughs> Uh, with half a dozen one in AIX and Solaris, but Linux Linux as a general is 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 the top dog in uh, cluster environments, but Debian specifically is not. I think we should. I think we have um, uh, a long road to go to to go. I think we have um, a lot of nodes to to get into. If we want to be really representative in the cluster community, to what? Answer. Well, again, my only uh, comment on this is if you contact, you know, so you've talked to some of the companies that produce cluster hardware, and some of them do have Debian and do use Debian. So the question I would ask them is, why did you choose Debian over a different distribution? And then to contact the people in the, um, in the places that don't use Debian and say, why did you choose this other one? I remember when Red Hat first started charging for their Enterprise Edition, and their charge was something like $1,000 a node and they came to the supercomputing conference in, I forget where it was that year, and I went up to them and asked them, how much are you going to charge the cluster people for their clusters? And they said, $1,000 a node. And I said, good luck. Um, 
So, I mean, obviously they've, they've changed their licensing somewhat since then, but I, I would imagine that people who run clusters, who run Red Hat Enterprise, are still paying some amount of money to Red Hat and for something, I hope. So, you know, there must be a reason why they're doing that. Um, again, my understanding of Rocks and, and Oscar are basically that they are more or less, you know, they use a distribution as a basis, but then they add their management software around it, and it isn't, it isn't a distribution like Red Hat is a distribution or Debian is a distribution. It's more of a wrapping around a, a, some basic distribution. Yeah, um, Rox is based on, on CentOS. Um, the version that we use at, at, at my company is Rox 421, I think. It's based on CentOS, uh, CentOS 4. It goes um, at uh, Sarge time, I think. Um, so one thing, one thing that might help uh, convince them to go with Debian would be more of a liaison between Debian and themselves so that every time there was a new release of Debian ca that came out, it would be easier for them to upgrade than you know, then it might be with CentOS, if CentOS wasn't paying as much attention, because CentOS is, is based off of Red Hat. So there may be a, a disconnect there that makes it difficult for them to keep up with releases of CentOS that Debian could help to solve with a little bit of communication back and forth. Um, I guess that because CentOS, it, uh, it follows more or less the same uh, release schedule of Red Hat Enterprise. It's just uh, cleaned up Red Hat, uh, cleaned up and recompiled Red Hat Enterprise. So they have the same reschedule and, uh, and uh, maintenance uh, dates, maintenance uh, periods like Red Hat Enterprise. And uh, I think one of the reasons that uh, people, sh people, um, people don't use Debian is sometimes is the lack of the inside champ, of which I've which I've spoken. Uh, that without this guy, uh, people don't, they don't they don't really go after um, quite a lot. They just um, they just f take something that they know that somewhere else uh, did it and it just worked. It they they just install it like um, s uh, real uh, scientists and engineers they don't uh, um, actually they think about the same questions that we uh, as developers think they don't they don't actually think about this um, freedom and open source they that we do praise to, that we do praise very much so that's why I think that uh, Debian has a long time to, uh, Debian has a long road to, to walk to, to, it is uh, a big, big player in the cluster market. We have, we don't have um, mindshare, if we, if we want to say so, and because people they don't. Because, especially because uh, when installing Debian in a cluster, some things that they just don't work, they don't just works. Uh, people get afraid of uh, using Debian because, oh, because uh, Debian is hard to install. That same old uh, phantom that Debian is hard to install. Well, um, I'd, um, I work at SGI and I have uh, had access to a uh, an ice box, which is uh, what uh, we sell as a cluster, and um, it was my bounce box, so I tried to install Debian on it, and um, uh, the Lenin uh, installer at that point wouldn't boot on it. So, like, I could debug it and spend time on it, but at that point I just really needed to work, and 
I believe that when you get to deploy a cluster, you just don't want to debug an installer. You just want it to work. Um, actually, it looks like a few years ago, SGI was using Debian as the base OS for the um, operating system that was shipped on the clusters. Um, again, that's I haven't been in the company for a really long time. That's more corridor noises than anything else. And I've been trying to look why we moved away to go to SUSE. Uh, part of the thing could be that SUSE slash 10 is uh, shipping a 2.6.16 kernel with a lot of work that has been made to backport all the fixes to the kernel while maintaining a lot of ABI compatibility. Um, that in those machines you sometimes have hardware for which the vendor will ship you a binary module that will work only on one uh, kernel and uh, and that's really important to make it work and uh, the kernel team is not doing that in Debian because we don't have the manpower or the time to do it but that's things that you require to make it work properly. Um, I've been told about a network driver which had a free software uh, yeah, implementation that was really, really slow uh, compared to the binary one and absolutely unusable for, for people in that environment. So that's some of the things. Yes, yeah. so the, speedy old. There, there really are sort of, I think, three categories of things that get in the way of, of Debian having a larger cluster market share right now. And if this is something we want to work on, we have to figure out how much of this we can address and then come up with a good plan for addressing it. The first one is that um, lots of clusters do run with interesting interconnect fabrics and things like this for which the device drivers may not be fully integrated into a kernel.org kernel and therefore may not be in our default kernel packages that we're shipping. Um, and you know, there, there's, there's always device driver issues with different kinds of hardware, but there's plenty of cluster hardware today available today that Debian runs very well on. So um, there, there's certainly that class of, of cases that we can think about. But I don't think we should get bogged down on that because there are two other classes of uh, things that we ought to think about. One is that a lot of people um, running clusters are running you know, commercial ISV provided applications on those clusters. And when they do that, they have the same problem of the choice of underlying operating system that anybody with a dependency on a commercial application does. And that is that that application provider is going to choose the set of operating systems that they choose to certify that application for use on if you want to have support for it. And today, if that's Linux, it's probably one of the commercial distributions for lots of you know, good business reasons. Um, and there is a chicken and egg situation there where if there were lots of demand for those applications on Debian for use on clusters, they would probably port them. But you know, how do you get there if the applications aren't available? How do you break that cycle? But the third thing is that for whatever reason, the, there are a number of cluster-oriented distributions that are out there. I mean, Rox is one example. There are others. Um, and many of those seem to have been built on, you know, a debranded, rebranded Red Hat uh, package base. It may well be because they see some opportunity to be technically compatible with uh, some of these binary applications that are built and certified on, on Red Hat or, or SUSE or something. Uh, I don't really know what the driving force or the history behind that is. But it seems to me that one opportunity would be to create uh, some custom Debian distribution or other uh, lightly derived version of the distribution that's specifically targeting uh, the cluster community and includes you know, some interesting management tools and related things that would make it attractive to them. I don't know if such a Debian-based distribution exists right now or not, but if not, then when someone goes and starts doing you know, Google or whatever searches looking for Linux and clusters, they may not see us as being a, an immediately obvious choice. Yeah, one of the one of the other barriers that I've seen to to Debian uh, adoption in clusters is exactly of uh, proprietary applications like uh, Fluid Dynamics applications that are. Um, I I don't remember the, the application, but uh, it's. Uh, Lots of um, engineer, lots of engineering applications like uh, wind tunnels, wind tunnel simulations, and 
that use a lot of uh, dynamic fl uh, fluids uh, computations and they are very very expensive uh, applications and they just and when you see when you go to the to the to the the software house uh, web page it it only it only it only says um, Red Hat Enterprise three four uh, Suzy uh, Suzy nine Suzy ten and that's it about Linux. Another another operating systems may have HP UX or Solaris or AIX from IBM, but that's but that's it. Um, I think that another f another thing is of is of drivers that, like Dave said, like mir there's no there's no free Mirinet drivers available today. Only binary blobs that you just dump in your kernel. And they, they are made only for SUSE and for Red Hat. So there's, there's another barrier of, uh, of inclusion. While on the other side, um, most Infinity Band providers that I know, they, they have uh, free drivers, and uh, most of them are already on the main, mainline kernel. And that's a good thing. Well, actually, Bedale says he doesn't know the history of it, but I do. And the thing is that back in the early days of the supercomputers, Red Hat gave a lot of attention to it, and they actually put out a, a very early CD called the Rocket Science CD. And it just had all of the software for clustering of that time on that CD. And it got a lot of the people in the national labs who did a lot of the work on things like Rock and Oscar using Red Hat which is why they were so upset when Red Hat changed their licensing. Of course, CentOS got around that. But when you say that, yes, you know, uh, you know, InfiniBand is available with some open drivers, but MirrorNet is not, well, but that's the thing. With Red Hat or SUSE, you can get both, and you're not tied to just one. See, I mean, it's, it's the whole ecology of it. It's also the ecology that, that a lot of the people that work on supercomputers are not computer scientists. They're scientists. They're engineers. And they're still programming with, programming with Fortran and stuff like that. Not that there's anything wrong with Fortran. Fortran okay. 77. Some, sometime 90. Sometime 90. But in any, case, in any case, what they want is the same thing running on their notebook so they can do their preliminary programming and everything and then take it over to, you know, the cluster. And, and these are all a group of things to do it. My greatest, my greatest suggestion would be to aim towards putting together a package that, as, as before, which would get in students using Debian so as they went up and, and came out, they would say, hey, Debian's a great distribution for doing this. You know, and, and that would be your inside person that you say you're champion to getting it spread out across a lot more of these areas. Or to pick, or to pick a side of, of, of high performance computing that a lot of the national labs, for example, don't even think about. For example, financial computing, data mining, you know, that type of supercomputing that, you know, it, it would be a whole new marketplace that a lot of the Debian packages could actually utilize that. Would it concentrate on things like you know, the real multi-core type of programming, so open, you know, open MP to, to get that going? And pardon me for saying so, but from my experience, the, G, uh, the GCC compilers do not produce the same type of performance that you would see out of a really commercial compiler that is tuned to particular architecture. You know, you're going to see a, a, a five or ten percent performance that over two thousand processors is like two hundred processors that you've got. Right? Um, but we don't just have GCC as free software compiler anymore. If you look at I64, one of, uh, if you look at I64, one of the architectures still used in HPC, mm -hmm. you see that last time I checked on half of the spec benchmarks, actually the Pro64 compiler which is the open source, all this GI compiler is still a fast compiler, much faster than a vendor compiler. Well, I wouldn't use the Itanic anyway, so. 
But, <laughs> but, but as I said, the Pro64 is picking up a little bit of stuff. Intel has some people working on it. Also for other platforms, there is LLVM. Mm -hmm. So it's not like GCC is the only compiler we still have. Okay, but the thing is, when you're sitting there with your stopwatch trying to figure out how fast the compiler is, because all you're interested in is CPU. Um, As opposed I guess to the portability. I guess that, um, I guess that's not just that, GCC is not that bad. I've seen uh, tests made for by uh, Brazilian University uh, showing that uh, with uh, with the same level of uh, optimization, GCC 4.2 has less than 1% of, it was less than 1% lower than uh, Intel 9 compiler uh, in C and C++. But uh, it was, it was uh, much lower without op optimizations. But I think that, um, I think that GCC why it has its its uh, bad things and allow, but GCC is going pretty strong on, and it's getting better I each release. Um, if we t if we do the same the same test again, which is we we GCC for three, um, I'm sure that uh, the difference between uh, GCC and Intel compiler nine would be ev even even smaller. And one of the things that you should be pushing with this is in the universities that are trying to teach computer science and trying to teach high performance computing is the fact that you can see the source code for these compilers where you can't see the source code. That's a huge advantage for in an educational space. Okay, that, you know, you should be leveraging your, the openness of the operating system and the openness of the compilers to the educational marketplace. And then you'll build that, that uh, you know, support as, as the students come out of the college and go to work for different companies. Yeah, I had a few words after your talk. Uh, uh, I personally work in a French aerospace lab. We are big users of high performance computing, supercomputers and the like. This is not really my field of expertise. I'm very sorry for that. Our supercomputers are, as far as I know, running commercial Linux distributions for only one reason, because, because this is why what we were supplied with and only for that reason. The other reason probably is because, as you said, and I wanted to confirm what we said, the, the showstopper also has been probably the commercial libraries, the commercial Fortran compiler. Yes, we are using Fortran. I confirm that. Sometimes Fortran 90. And actually, I think that the people who are using our supercomputers and our cluster don't care a lot about the C compiler. They don't care at all, but they care a lot about the Fortran compiler that's on the supercomputer. And if this Fortran compiler is, for instance, provided by Intel and only works on one Red Hat derived distribution, there will be no choice to we will have yeah. to go with them. Just to have an idea, all the all the the weather forecast models that I use in, in my company, they they it is um, almost uh, wholly written in Fortran 90. <laughs> yeah, we actually use the just very the, same just the MPI uh, part is written in C. We use the very same kind of supercomputer that in the French Meteo Center. And this is exactly the same culture. And the, this culture is a very old culture. And it takes a lot of time to change it. And not only from, through the students, but the, through the infrastructure people. You need the infrastructure people, those who run these uh, supercomputers, to also get this idea that there are some free distributions around.
Anybody else? Well, so I'd like to thank you, everybody, to come listen, come see me babble and this this stuff. <laughs> um, I hope we can s we can talk a lot more uh, by mailing lists or by private mail or ear whatever. And I'm I'm personally going to pursue it what I'm what I what I said here today. And if if anybody wants to. If anybody want have any idea or wants to talk me, with me after that, I'll be at the Hack Lab. So thank you a lot for coming. <laughs>